I've been looking forward to the reading tonight. David is the founding executive director, writer in residence of the Attic Writers Workshop in Southeast Portland and an independent literary studio. They provide workshops to over 300 writers annually since 1999. I think the figures are maybe even up uh, a little bit this year. His books of poetry are Shattering Air, 1996, Pilgrims and Beggars, 2002, Wild Civility in 2003, a book that he wrote exclusively in a nine-line sonnet form he called An American Sonnet, and The Book of Men and Women, 2009, which is not out yet, but coming out in a couple of months, I think. He is the editor of the award-winning anthology, Long Journey, Contemporary Northwest Poets, 2006. His poems and essays have appeared extensively. He's also been reviewing poetry for over 10 years in a variety of journals and newspapers, including the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the New York Times. And since 19, 2003, he's been the poetry columnist for the Oregonian. What he's going to do tonight, too, he said, is that he will read for approximately 50 minutes. We'll kind of see how that goes. And then he's going to take some questions at that point. And he will do that before he reads the last poem. And after that, he will conclude with the last poem that he's chosen. Would you join me in welcoming our reader tonight, David Weisfield. David? And Does this work for everybody or just for your camera? That's just the camera. Yeah. <laughs> There's three seats right here, which locks you in for the night. Um, well, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> uh, Tom will sit there. I've never been here before, and I've, it's just like this thing is a, such a library box. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think it's a beautiful house, and <clears throat> I'm grateful that I was invited to participate and, and meet y'all um, and see friends and uh, meet some new people. Um, you know, this morning Tom called and asked me if I was bringing books. <clears throat> I have books. I've, I've written a few, um, but I don't have them, any for you. <clears throat> You're out of luck, which is, you know, maybe okay. And so to rationalize the fact that I didn't pull it together to sell you books, uh, I, I thought I would mostly focus on new poems, which, you know, permits me, sort of, that's me, it's an escape clause. You can't buy them anyway. <laughs> uh, at least not yet. And, and in addition to that, um, in addition to just reading my own work, uh, I want to do a few covers and uh, read, mix in poems of other people, sort of talk about poetry broadly, think about ways, try to share with you some things that have been on my mind about poems and about writing poems and use both my own work and the poems of others to exemplify that. So if you'll indulge my wanting to read of poems by others that I really love and share them with you. And whether you'll indulge or not, that's entirely what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to uh, do something I think is not done that often. I, I'm going to be, you know, usually go to a reading and people, you know, read their newest thing, you know, their newest books and their latest, they do greatest hits. And, and then they, W.S. Merwin does it the best. He reads for about an hour and a half, and then he says he's going to read a couple other things, brand new poems, and everybody's excited. And then he reaches under and he bring, brings out a, a manila folder that weighs about 55 pounds, and it's a thud. And you think, my God, Bill Merwin's going to read for another hour, and he just starts going through more. And I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to read for two hours from new work, <laughs> and 12 minutes from old things. 
Uh, but I'm going to start with brand new things uh, and then sort of work my way back a little bit. Uh, and, to, and I'll explain all that. The newest of poems I've been writing, um, uh, Tom mentioned that in, in my last book, Wild Civility, I um, worked almost exclusively in a single form. It was a nine line poem. It wasn't, it was something I invented in a way, but it was invented out of frustration. I wanted to write a series of sonnets, and, but I wanted them to sound like they, they were very American rather than British or Italian, and I just failed at it. I was terrible at it. And so I blamed the form and, and sort of pushed it around and created these nine line poems. I'm not going to read any of those to you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do like having a kind of project, a formal project. Uh, and, and I find that when I work within um, uh, a vessel, and have to fill that vessel, it liberates something in my imagination. And so the current vessel I'm working in is epistolary. I'm writing poems in the form of letters. And they are exactly letters. I, it's, part of it was that there were some people I felt I needed to write to. And I thought I would try to merge marriage, marry that with my art form. The epistolary form is, is Old and ancient, Horace wrote epistles. They were really something. Um, Keats wrote some, and there are many other poets. The poet who uh, most recently uh, wrote epistles that uh, got a lot of people's attention and, and a lot of readers are still affectionate toward is uh, Richard Hugo, uh, who one of his last books, I um, get the title wrong, was called 33 Letters and 13 Love Poems. Dreams. No, Dreams. Now I'm mixing that up with Neruda. Doesn't he have yeah. 33 love poems and 13 songs of despair? Or, or the other way around. <laughs> 33 love, 33 letters and 13 dreams. The dreams are terrible. They're, they're, he tried to write like Salvador Dali, and he just didn't do it. He was a poet of, re, of resolving things. The letters are fantastic. I'm going to start with one of his letters. It's a letter he wrote to the poet Charles Simic. Uh, who he met um, uh, at San, in San Francisco. And um, Simic, uh, uh, Hugo was a bombardier during the Second World War, and Simic lived in a town that Hugo bombed as a boy. Can you hear okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll talk softer. <laughs> the titles of these letters were really efficient. This one's called Letter to Simic. <laughs> Letter to Simic from Boulder. <clears throat> by Richard Hugo. Dear Charles, and so we meet once in San Francisco, and I learned I bombed you long ago in Belgrade when you were five. I remember. We were after a bridge on the Danube, hoping to cut the German armies off as they fled north from Greece. We missed. Not unusual considering I was one of the bombardiers. I can't hit my ass if I sat on the Nord Den or rode a bomb down singing the Star Spangled Banner. I remember Belgrade, opened like a rose when we came in. Not much flack. I didn't know about the daily hangings, the 80,000 slobs who dangled from German ropes in the city, lessons to the rest. I was interested mainly in staying alive. That moment the plane jumped free from the weight of bombs and we went home. What did you speak then, sir, I suppose? And what did your mind do with the terrible howl of bombs? What is Serb for fear? 
it must be the same as in English, one long primitive wail of dying children, one child fixed forever in a dead stare. I don't apologize for the war or what I was. I was willingly confused by the times. I think I even believed in heroics, but for others, not for me. I believed the necessity of that suffering world, hoping it would learn not to do it again. But I was young. The world never learns. History has a way of making the past palatable, the dead a dream. Dear Charles, I am glad you avoided the bombs, that you live with us now and write poems. I must tell you, though, I felt funny that day in San Francisco. I kept saying to myself, he was on the ground that day, the sky eerie mustard and our engines roaring everything out of the way. And the world comes clean in moments like that for survivors. The world comes clean as clouds in summer, the pure puffed white, soft birds careening in and out. Our lives with the chance to drift on slow over the world, our Bomb bays empty, the targets forgotten, the enemies ignored. Nice to meet you, finally, after all the mindless hate. Next time, if you want to be sure you survive, sit on the bridge I'm trying to hit and wave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming in on course, <coughs> but nervous, and my crosshairs flutter. Wherever you are on earth, you are safe. I'm aiming, but my bombs are candy, and I've lost the lead plane. Your friend, Dick. <sighs> to begin this project, I, I felt I owed, at least um, early on, a uh, poem to Richard Hugo, uh, kind of asking for permission to, to assume it. So I wrote this poem called To Hugo from Soto, south of downtown in Seattle. Soto. It doesn't really roll off the tongue like Soho, but it's a good try. <laughs> Dear Dick, I didn't know him. Did anybody know him? No. Did anybody know Richard Hugo in this room? Great semi-pro baseball. All field, no, no hit I heard. Dear Dick, the new stadium south of downtown brought the city hope at the beginning of the century, but hasn't been filled in a while. Surely the plan was to win. The great Japanese right fielder can't save a whole town with just 200 singles a year. So I drive on, as you would have, book ended with Bon Homme and Thoughts of Home, thinking about writing letters to smithereens and knowing I have to ask your permission to carry it off, or carry it on. Not so much a favor as knowing that without your postal stacks, I'm no one. Anyway, the banner clouds here cluster and block and cream the sun, and the cowbirds crowd the dirt cheap monuments, pecking at dribs. The hubbub here is absent slutty sagas. True, some years ago, I read in your poem something about sailor's knots and half-tapped kegs and wished we'd shared a trailer home long enough to sing the old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be. Not 10 times running, but 50. <laughs> Dick, this city is gigantic now. Cuffed up, whinnying, off-center, off-season, mean-spirited. 
and everyone knows that some night during sleep we'll all die or just come through. I wake for sure now, and driving past the sputtering willows and small fields, I trust the shafts of shadows as if they were dreamed into my head by a single-minded, lonely, pent-up god. The road is that wild with cracks of wind from one lane to the next. How, I wonder, if fear is the flower I water at dawn. Can I amuse <coughs> with this caustic tongue? Mole nothing worth asking, asking for nothing. Such notes from one troubadour to another has gotten rickety on the little stalks, I know that. I pray some days that I'll get caught constantly looking backward at the scatter of light and at every votive mossy name. What do you say, Dick? A future of winners? Do you just need a good pitch to hit? I'll keep a weather eye on your kind. I promise. Dave. The really cool thing about writing these letters is they're letters. I mean, they're, uh, what I feel in making them is for people maybe reading, if there's ever going to be anyone, you get, it's like overhearing a conversation. It's private, but it's, it's voyeuristic. I'm going to read one more of them. Uh, they're a little full, I think. Um, I have a, <coughs> a dear friend who um, is ill. Uh, well, he has a, a lymphoma. And he's actually, actually, I shouldn't put it that way. He's doing, he's great. He runs 10 miles a day. I mean, he's, he's just, you know, doing this thing. But he has lymphoma, and it scared me. It scared me like crazy. And um, I saw him. We saw him in um, <coughs> Walla Walla. I should say that the titles of these poems, they need some sort of sonic pleasure for me. Hugo from Soto. Um, I wrote one to a, a poet you may know named Stanley Plumley, who I adore. He's like a father to me. I called, I was on Lum, Lum, Lummy Island, Lummy yeah. Island, to Plumley from Lummy. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to have, for me, I, <clears throat> something. And uh, I was in Walla Walla. I met, I dro we drove all the way out there, you know, with, Walla Walla is way out there. The next stop is like Tappan Zee Bridge. I mean, it's out there. And just for breakfast. We went out there, you know, and then had a little drink, and then had for breakfast, and then drove back. Just, it was, doesn't live around here. So. And driving back, I began thinking about our friendship. Um, it's called Two Wyman from Walla Walla. Dear Chris, both these poems are driving poems. Think about that. On the road now, I begin with the thing that hurts, as some smarty says one must. There is a remedy for everything except death, though I think the French say that honey is not for asses. It's been 12 hours of driving for two rounds of mimosas. <laughs> Let's call that our blood and ribbon. Let's call that our blood and ribbon and nervy dash. This morning, the light at the outdoor breakfast was weak, and even the potter's field, the acre of vineyards, and the new distillery at Katrina's was a good thump reined in by hubbub. All those syrupy kids in need of a bath by 8 a.m. That light over the morning had so much near transparency, swerving and flicking and skimming against the heat rising on the hill. And the wind was not so rowdy as it was a token of many ranges, not so much an ode to pleasure, but apologia for living on, as if the half lost days, fervent days, shuttered days, can only be continually remembered in prayer where the blood unwrinkles like a shroud. Once miles from here, on the coast, in the Driftwood Library, I overheard a wounded woman 
reading Auden to herself, out loud, but whispering, like a small child does, who has just learned to read, with that slow, jaw-stretched, strung-along give-and-take between voice and mind, part panicked, part captured, as if in her nervous system, language was becoming unarrested. We were in the quiet room with the magazines lined neatly and the windows shined over with the flat light of the aqueous wind-filtered air. Sprouted light, stoked light. No more attached to lament than head is to love, than human is to arm. She was whispering. Lay your sleeping head, my love, human on my faithless arm, over and over, as if the two lines were embryonic to a vanished burn or an ache, as if the geology of human was mineral in the rock of faithless. Plenty makes us poor, says Dryden. And despite what St. Matthew says, even her reading can't heal the sick or cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, or cast out demons. Then the woman dropped off from the archways of words into a long moment of covenant, without pain or love, unbidden, moving inwards, as into a gray valley of thought. And as I watched her drifting to sleep in the quiet room, I imagined for no reason that she was dreaming of a gardener's dog that won't eat the lettuce, but won't let others either. I tell you this, Chris, with the confidence of an egg fighting a rock. She was sleeping, and Auden was the resin in everyone's mind. Earlier on the drive home, over the high desert passes, with the river arrested and pinned with new light, some logic sequined itself inside of me, a kind of inquest I had to stomach, like the fear of dying. And even though it was spring, I was thinking of snowy ditches, and endless flurries. I wanted to um, talk about poems as revelations, not revelations, <laughs> as a revelation, <coughs> small r. Poems and prayers are not the same, I don't think. One requires faith. <laughs> you can decide which one that is, but <laughs> I want to read. <laughs> okay, honestly, I just love this poem I'm about to read, and I wanted to read it. But I uh, wanted to say that for me, at least, and one of the things that gets talked about a lot, Tom mentioned the Attic Writers Workshop. One of the things that gets talked about a lot is one of the harder things to do in a poem is to um, dramatize thinking. I mean, it's hard to show thinking in a poem. So often, um, somewhere in the composition of a poem, you, you, you get an idea that you know where you're headed. And, and sometimes it's the case that you make that so obvious in the poem that anyone reading it also knows where you're headed. And so it's hard to act out, to, to think through things in a poem freshly, as if it's a discovery. That's the artifice, I guess, of the poem. <clears throat> the poet who died a couple years ago named Anthony Hecht. Hecht was an interesting guy. Um, he served in the Second World War also. He's around the same generation as Hugo. <clears throat> um, and was um, uh, in the regiment or the troop or whatever that um, Americans who arrived at the death camps. And he wrote about 
uh, morals and morality a lot. That became uh, a big theme of his, as you can imagine, someone who experienced that. This poem is not quite like that, but uh, it's called A Hill. And what I love about it is you can see the thinking take place. And I, I, I look at this poem a lot. I have to say, I, I, I feel very inspired by it. A Hill by Anthony Hecht. In Italy, where this sort of thing can occur, I had a vision once, though you understand it was nothing at all like Dante's or the visions of saints, and perhaps not a vision at all. I was with some friends, picking my way through a warm, sunlit piazza in the early morning. A clear fretwork of shadows from huge umbrellas littered the pavement and made a sort of lucent shallows in which was moored a small navy of carts. Books, coins, old maps, cheap landscapes, and ugly religious prints were all on sale. The colors and noise, like the flying hands, were gestures of exultation. So that even the bargaining rose to the ear like a voluble godliness. And then, where it happened, the noises suddenly stopped, and it got darker. Push carts and people dissolved. <clears throat> And even the great Farnes Palace itself was gone for all its marble. In its place was a hill, mole-colored and bare. It was very cold, close to freezing, with a promise of snow. The trees were like old ironwork gathered for scrap outside a factory wall. There was no wind, and the only sound for a while was the little click of ice as it broke in the mud under my feet. I saw a piece of ribbon snagged on a hedge, but no other sign of life, and then I heard what seemed the crack of a rifle. A hunter, I guessed. At least I was not alone. But just after that came the soft and papery crash of a great branch somewhere, unseen, falling to earth. And that was all, except for the cold and silence that promised to last forever, like the hill. Then prices came through, and fingers, and I was restored to the sunlight and my friends. But for more than a week, I was scared by the plain bitterness of what I had seen. All this happened about 10 years ago, and it hasn't troubled me since. But at last today, I remembered that hill. It lies just to the left of the road north of Poughkeepsie. And as a boy, I stood before it for hours in wintertime. <clears throat> in the fall of the last two years, um, I have <laughs> commuted to North Carolina. I use the term commuted loosely. Sometimes it seems like I'm there forever. The people I love are here. Oh, I love my students there, but not the same way. And I feel like I'm in exile sometimes. This is, this is under the Department of Self-Loathing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last year, I really felt it, and uh, I began thinking of the... Uh, Roman poet Ovid, who was exiled 
and wrote a poem, like wrote Tristia, this long poem, which he tried to use this poem, can you believe it? Use this poem to induce people to bring him back to Rome. He was a city person. He was an urban man. And to be out in uh, Colchis, I think is where he was, or just, just killed him. And he never, he never returned. <clears throat> well, the poem is a dramatic monologue, but uh, like many dramatic monologues, it's a shared sound, it's a shared voice between both Ovid and myself. And I try to write through Ovid about my own emotions, I guess. Or write through my own emotions about Ovid, I don't know which one. Ovid in exile. <clears throat> and there's a discovery, I guess. Uh, back to my theme, there's a discovery. It's too late for superstition to erupt out of the micro-mercy I putter around with in my head's nights in this room, shop-worn as a purist. The sanity, like a tiny nag from some other summer. Today, the impropriety empties into a promise. The port of call all rump and prey, and the far-off sunrise sprouting like an omen. Each morning, this spiky heat litters joy and reverses into nowhere. Each afternoon, like snipes suddenly caught among the turnips, I saw this once, the children in the courtyard pout toward supper, and the mist from somewhere else stains the rinseless air. And the semen, I fear, well, all of it a bang-bang gamble. Meanwhile, these yawning magnolias throb like men at dawn. And the women grieve and get aroused and roam the city in wigs, vowing to be givers, grinning, smutty, as if put out to sea. So much talk about veering and merging and on occasion being a good fit for tea and bread, crimes and guilt. Even from this room, with my body lanky and impish and ousted, it's not hard to sag into the sulky opuses with the dead weight of whiskey and a regime of primness. Call it my new affirmation. Still, today at last, without warning, autumn cut into the heat skin like an overgrown harvest, the coolness gently sweeping the lost summer into a mirror of communion. Somewhere, a dog barked deep inside of my veins with half-sunk loneliness and the fields beyond the city went unplowed, and the sky tucked in tightly. And finally I imagined, unstrangled and gleaming into the sharp world, two boats, like incantations, cleared the open sea. The, this new uh, book of mine that's coming out in a couple months uh, is called The Book of Men and Women. And that last poem is in it. The letters are not. Title tells all. <laughs> Put that title, The Book of Men and Women. Um, and there are a lot of poems in the, about the theme of love. Uh, um, difficult love and discovered love and difficult joy and discovered joy and then love and joy itself. And I thought what I would do, <clears throat> sort of aim toward the end here, is read a couple of three love poems of the different types, difficult, discovered, and revealed, and then of that I like out there in the world, and then a few of, from the manuscript or book 
then take some questions, like Tom said, and then finish with one last uh, poem of the same theme. Philip Larkin, the British poet, <coughs> uh, was a librarian. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the right place for that. There's a devastating poem about difficult love. It's called Talking in Bed. Sounds like some of you know it. <laughs> Hard to read, but really, it's a very difficult poem. It's difficult. <clears throat> difficult, difficult, difficult. Talking in Bed by Philip Larkin. Talking in bed ought to be easiest. Lying together, there goes back so far an emblem of two people being honest. Yet more and more, time passes silently. Outside, the wind's incomplete unrest builds and disperses clouds in the sky. And dark towns heap up on the horizon. None of this cares for us. Nothing shows why, at this unique distance from isolation, it becomes still more difficult to find words at once true and kind. Or not untrue, or not unkind. <clears throat> A poet, Michael Collier, who lives in, near Baltimore, he's from Phoenix. Uh, and he tends to write poems of a kind of anecdotal narrative uh, variety. And this is one of those, but they tend to be kind of poems in which something is understood that wasn't understood before. And this one just caught my attention when I first read it. I just couldn't, one, believe he wrote it. Not, I mean, I adore his poems, but I just, it was just something different. And um, it's about discovery. It's called, it's a very short poem, it's eight lines long. <clears throat> it's called An Awful Story. When she came into his room, he was asleep. And when she touched him, he woke. Her hand on his shoulder, her knee at his mouth. And in the darkness, she looked like a boy. When he tried to sit up, she covered his ears with her hands. Save ourselves from ourselves, she said. And then a wind stirred in the room as if she'd placed those words in his mouth. <clears throat> the poet Tom Gunn, I've often thought of as a poet of camaraderie love. And um, I just think this is one of the sweet, this is side B of those other poems. <laughs> it's called The Hug. It was your birthday. We had drunk and dined half of the night with our old friend who'd showed us in the end to a bed I'd reached in one drunk stride. Already I lay snug and drowsy with the wine and dozed on one side. I dozed, I slept. My sleep broke on a hug, suddenly from behind, in which the full lengths of our bodies pressed. Your instep to my heel, my shoulder blades against your chest. It was not sex, but I could feel the whole strength of your body set or braced to mine and locking me to you as if we were still 22 when our grand passion had not yet become familial. My quick sleep had deleted all of intervening time and place. I only knew the stay of your secure, firm, dry embrace. Hopeful.
<laughs> compared to the other ones. <coughs> I don't know if anyone reads her anymore, but I do still love Edna St. Vincent Millay. I just, I don't know. She doesn't really help me as a writer, but I think she's delightful. And there's a poem of hers called Requerdo that uh, really comes to the theme of discovered love, uh, actual love. <clears throat> it's a great rhythm to it. Requerdo. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable. But we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon. And the whistles kept blowing and the dawn came soon. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. And you ate an apple and I ate a pear from a dozen of each we had bought somewhere. And the sky went wan and the wind came cold and the sun rose dripping like a bucket full of gold. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed good morrow, mother, to a shawl-covered head and bought a morning paper, which neither of us read. And she wept, God bless you, for the apples and the pears. And we gave her all our money but our subway fares. <laughs> In a couple of years, no one is going to be able to write that poem because there aren't going to be any newspapers. <clears throat> <laughs> we gave her our internet connection <laughs> and our free subscription. So I'm going to read to uh, one of the difficult joy, one of discovered, and then I'll stop and take some questions. If you have any questions, um, now's the time to start thinking of your questions because it's always embarrassing for everybody when they're on there. <laughs> It's called Evening Watch. It's a phrase I've always liked, a kind of military expression. Uh, now I see the eggish waves hatching beneath the geese. Now the risk of love comes back and moves the crisis from this face. A talon's clutch of sugar, an hour of stale loss, all the kid stuff to bear, and wiser ways of introducing fear, none of it like this moon, a one-eyed holy man. You sleep, you sleep, and soon the shabby chill is gone, and the illumination. I think of no rationales, though maps could perish, Passers-by turn cruel and become invisible to justify a wish. The light has oversold this wound. You sleep. You turn. The air wheels out and mills around the room like proof, then bends perversely to the floor. You sleep. You turn. The shadows don't hide dangers or wrongs. And standing here can't do away with dark, nor span the oneness of a man. There's a lot of hummingbirds uh, now where I live. One of them has a name. Richie? Jesse. Jesse. <laughs> little bird. Little bird. Still my... <laughs> Jesse. I can't honestly tell Jesse from the other hummingbirds. The six year old can. The hummingbird. Today I studied pearls and fish in a procession of sheltered fowl, sang Bone of My Bones, and danced to the tune that was played with 
and without a bride, with and without saints or seed. Then the hummingbird landed in the feeder, and like a summer of mime, it replenished the earth with its red frown and ghostly bruise. I asked myself, could I cleave to luck or hoist sorrow into night by a candle's flame? The ground was a fountain spill of dozy swifts. And if we'd planted a garden of rapture, as if we'd planted a garden of rapture to bloody our hands. We were resting in the grass with your face to the sun and your knees bent and the dogwood ablaze with its pink scars. I could have touched you as I touch a petal and all along your eyes alert and green and open to grief. If the arbor will give us shade to remember and forget, then we can loaf and watch the wingy light and wait for rain to carry the sky to us and no longer beg for summer. When? <laughs> Whenever. <laughs> um, well, it varies, you know, really. Um, I mean, there are times that, for me, I just talked about. I think if you can regularize your writing, that's best. And for me, when it's regularized, I like to write in the morning. Except when I like to write in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> or when I don't sleep well, and then I like to write at night. Um, but it just depends. It really depends for me. Um, sometimes I write regularly daily. Sometimes I just don't have time. I've got things going on. Sometimes I will say, I will confess, right now I'm not writing every day. Um, I will say I'm gestating. Uh, there's a book coming out. I'm kind of constantly thinking about that. I, I'm kind of willing to wait, let things kind of percolate. I'm working on these letter poems, but working might be a euphemism. Um, <laughs> Uh, but when I am working, uh, I think I do it, I only know a couple people who work this way. Uh, I think for some writers, at least it used to be for me when I would write, this is my practice, I guess. It used to be I would just try to write down whatever it was that was, you know, download, I guess would be the term. And then figure out what it was I had done, try to fashion that into a poem. So I go from best... First thought, best thought, to fashioning something. And I just found it very frustrating to work like that. Uh, a lot of second guessing. And now I work differently. I, I call materials together. I pull words together. I make lists of things I think are interesting at a certain given time. I always start with a title now first. And so before I do anything, I have a title. Um, and then I build until I feel like, oh, I get it now. I get what it is. And then I wait until I just, and then I get that feeling of sort of bursting out of you. But I have a, a checklist of items I want to work through. I don't use them all, and I don't keep them all, and I don't, and then you revise like anybody else. But that's kind of my practice. I, I don't keep a notebook. I wish I did. I don't have the organizational capacity. So I sort of keep the current thing in my pocket. And when I'm done, I throw it in a drawer and let it sit around for a while. I'm all embarrassed by that. <laughs> yeah. Could yeah. you comment on the form of the prose poem? Anything you might like to say about do you use that form? Or what do you think works in trying to do that form? Um, um, God, that's a great question. Um, I have written some prose poems. Um, not for a while. I think for poets my age, 
in their 20s. Um, <laughs> late 20s. Um, <clears throat> I didn't think poets my age, poets born in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the prose poem became our sonnet. And that there was a kind of a, uh, I don't know why this happened. I mean, I, maybe someone knows why, but it seemed like you had to kind of prove yourself or you had to prove something to the art form that you could make a poem in prose. I think uh, <clears throat> it has a long tradition, but the recent tradition of prose poetry in, um, from uh, that's my analysis, in American poetry uh, is, you know, you, there was metrical writing. It, it evolved into non-metrical writing. Um, and, and there's a, probably a common complaint among all of you who read poems a lot that it looks like the lines are just prose broken into lines. And then why not? Why make lines? I mean, when it's that soft, when the rhythms are that soft, why make lines? And then, then prose took over. Prose became an interesting form. How do you make it work like a poem and be in prose? And the prose is usually never very long. I mean, no one writes a prose poem novel. I'd like to see that. So I, I'll get to this. But I think that the, <clears throat> the characteristics of prose poetry are similar to the characteristics of po of lined poetry, lineation poetry. Interesting images, strong attitude, uh, uh, emotion, and so forth. I don't think that's any different. So you just accept it as, I hate to use this word, poetic, because you don't worry about lines so much. I like lines. I think lines are the central unit of poem. I have some resistance to prose poetry, but I'm not against it. Do you write it? I've, I've done a couple. Mm -hmm. And you've survived Tell Tale? Yeah, I, I think it offers something freeing because you just, you're thinking in the lines maybe, but you don't let it be what it, be that. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of like a fusion force, just mashing it together and now it's a block again. Yeah, yeah. Yet it still has the sound or the feeling of when it was a line or if it could be a line. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of thinking and writing about prose poems, contemporary prose poems, and why they, how they exist as entities. Mm -hmm. it, from in my personal experience, I wrote poems in lines, then I kicked them up into prose and thought that works. Mm -hmm. I just gave in. They, they seemed like lines that weren't really strong as lines, and then as prose, it seemed like an interesting uh, product. Are there certain kinds of fashions and? Uh, <coughs> How you construct a poem, like nowadays, you know, I don't see people doing a lot of, say, sustenance, but do certain emotions call that even now? The, to the sustenance? That, that kind of demand a certain kind of a form for the poetry? I, I would guess with individual poets, yeah. I mean, um, Wallace Stevens had a great expression. He said that the poet's one of the poet's kind of responsibilities to himself or herself is to find the form that will suffice. His quote is to find the form that will suffice. <clears throat> and um, Sestina would be a Sestina is a, a form which you're there's 39 lines. <clears throat> instead of rhyming at the end of the lines, for those who don't know, instead of rhyming at the end of the, the six line stanzas and at the end there's a three line stanza which is called an envoy, which I'll explain. I'm going to do this in 25 words. The, instead of rhyming at the end of the lines, there are six words which you use at the end of the lines, and they're organized per stanza in a particular defined order. And you repeat these words, or variations on the words, at the end of each line. And then the last three lines in the poem, you use all six in the three lines. Uh, very regimented. It is very regimented, and it makes you write to those and it does seem a little dolorous sometimes. It can be a little heavy. Um, my favorite one, one of my favorite ones, I should say, is by James Merrill. And he uses one, two, three, four, five, six as his six words. The words, one, two, three, four, five, six. And um, he uses two, two, and two. Right? So he works a variation there. Um, one point he... Um, he uses the, at the end of lines, for five, he couldn't use the number five, so he says, the last two words are belief, I've, as in I have, belief, I've. It's oh, wow. <clears throat> very cute. And um, one point for six, he can't use it, so he uses the word seeks, S-I-K-H-S. 
It's very funny. I think it's and it, and halfway through he realizes it's just a trifle, and it's a very fun poem. But I don't know if there are fads. I mean, there are definitely fads. I don't know that we necessarily, as readers of poetry, try to hang on and keep reading those poems which are most faddish. I think you still try to people read the poems that may have the most meaning to you personally as a reader. I think everybody has a poem or a couple poems that you feel like this really matters to me. It mattered to me at some point in my life and I still feel good about it. Like a jazz standard. Are there other questions at all? Yeah. Um, back to questions about how you work. How do you know when it's finished? <laughs> Dartboard? <laughs> um, well, for me, I mean, other people, I think, maybe have more certainty. Uh, for me, I just, the poem stops, two things happen. One is, I run out of solutions. Sometimes you run out of solutions and you know the poem isn't done, and so that's one thing. But sometimes you run out of solutions because you feel like you've gone as far as you can with the problems you thought the poem needed solving. <clears throat> And you could then really start to solve other problems. You can fantasize problems in the poem and muck it up. Um, but for me, I try to pay attention to the other side of that, which is the poem is saying to me, I'm done with you. I don't need anything more from you. This is it. This is where you're at. This is where we're at. And then I, you know, do whatever with it. And I, I just sort of will read through poems again and again and again. And if I think like, well, oh, that's 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 got it, that's done, then I just move through it. I don't I don't labor. It. <clears throat> you know, what's in the past is behind me. <laughs> are there other questions? Any other? You don't have to ask questions. Those are great questions. I wish I knew the answer. Though. I'm not sure how to word my question, but it's I it has to do with um, what do you think about the effect of. Uh, people um, studying how to write as opposed to just writing and the, you know, like what kind of effect it has on their creativity. Do you have an opinion on this? Do you have an answer already yeah, to this question? I, yeah. What I, is I, your answer? I, I just, <clears throat> I'm just thinking of my own personal experience with it. Is that when I've tried to sort of fit myself into a form or fit myself into kind of a way of doing <clears throat> a method? an art form, mm. whatever that was, like I used to be a ceramist, and when I did, when I studied it, I could learn certain techniques, but then I'd have to take those techniques and apply them to it, you know, to working with the clay in my own way. And so I'm, uh, I guess my concern as a writer now is, to, is I worry about uh, having my creativity... Um, sort of squelched out of me by having to do it a certain way, you know. Like the, a few times that I've tried to take classes, I've ended up dropping out of them because I just began to feel this sort of confinement of having to do it in a particular way. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, I don't know. The, you know, I think there, there, I have a couple of answers to that off the top of my head. One is, there are two kinds of questions one asks when they come into a writing class, uh, in my experience. One question that people ask who don't do well in writing classes, that struggle in writing, this is not, I'm not saying this is you, but I think they struggle with it, is they come into a writing class or they come into a painting class or they come, whatever, and they ask the question, what they want, the, the question they're asking that they most want an answer to is, am I good? And when the answer is not yes, if it's anything other than yes, then they pull back. It, it's, it plays with their confidence. Uh, or they resist. I mean, or they honestly resist. And then they might overcome that. The other question that someone asks when they come into a writing class, typically, or another kind of art form, is what is good? And it seems to me that when students come into uh, 
a, a workshop of some kind, artistic workshop, and they ask, what is good? They're more open to doing anything with their work to see if they can master that other kind of goodness. Uh, and so they're open to variation. They're open to experimentation. They're not so, uh, they don't clutch their work in the same way. Uh, I think that we, I think of poets in general, I don't know if it's true of the other you know, literary artists, uh, are really bad at thinking, well, once I start writing a thing, I'm making drafts. And I'm trying to go from first draft to end poem, to product. I'm not sure that other artists work that way. The visual artists do side work. They do, you know, studies. I don't know if you, if you write, if you look at a poem that you've worked on, if you write poems, do you, you know, look at an image and do you do studies of that image? Stanzas of it, phrases of it, working on it, without trying to, whether that fits into the poem or not. Um, and because of that, I think we work, in, like I say, in, in, the, in the spirit of drafts. And I find, at least in the students I work with, when we try to think about working in terms of variations or versions of the poem, but that frees people up. And once they start trying to make this version, well, in another version, I might do this. Well, in the other version, you might write the poem in the voice of a dog. Oh, well, okay, I'll try it. Who knows? It might help me out. In this other version, you might write it, uh, you know, standing on one foot. I mean, <clears throat> it's, these are kooky, but by thinking of them as versions rather than as drafts, you then open yourself up to more material and more opportunities for your work. You free your imagination so that you can make something. And then you have to make what all artists do, you have to make, start making selections, start making choices. This version is not any good. It was a nice exercise, that doesn't work. This version was better than the first thing I was working on. Is that what I'm working on, or is that another poem altogether? Until you work yourself toward the thing which, the things, which you think, to get to your question, are done or not done. And I find when you're just working on draft one to draft 50, you're working on one poem. When, you're working, when you make 50 versions of the poem, you could have 50 poems. And, and, and it releases you from the problem. I'm going to finish with one more love poem. It's called The Theory of Hats. <laughs> There's no theory in it. It's the last poem in this new book. The book begins, well, it begins that poem, The Evening Watch, but the sort of true beginning of the book is a poem uh, and a dramatic monologue in the voice of the prophet Abraham. Uh, it's called Genesis 12, and it's kind of a riff version of that. <laughs> you know, uh, of that uh, chapter or verse in which Abraham is wandering in the desert. <clears throat> and he's sort of uh, blinded into a kind of fanatic madness. I mean, he's fanatic in the best word, best sense of the word, uh, by the heat, heat of the desert. Um, I think the end of the poem is a phrase, uh, surely I've lost my mind, which I think is, you know, is ambiguous. Uh, fanatics have lost their mind. That's how they become so, so that's what, how their zealotry comes up. The, po the book ends, once it works through all these uh, permutations of love and uh, so forth, with um, a different version of the sun. The theory of hats. It is hard even to admit this theory of hats that to wear the faithless one brim tightly over the eyes, the featherless and discreet one, a hat with a secret code that says, to spoil the child is to fatten the serpent. To wear that hat imperfectly as a crow's crown against the sun is to bear the ruins of the unborn into our hearts. He shouting at the brunt of trees. She shifting like a seer to restore them. It is hard to know happiness with a hat like that. 
or to forget the pang sung with such burly impatience, or to heal the blurred things and the soft hurts. Even the blind self becomes a dervish, what with the torsion and the far-off vita nuova like a new virus or virtuoso, what with the tussles and old pure-lit suppressions. Then to be surprised by joy, like the last rain of summer, the big spiraling wounded animal of rain with no place to turn, drumming the brown grass, rain falling without meaning but perfectly faithful into the petals of wind and the unopened roots. Such tenderness look to like love, but unquestioned. Then some afternoon, with the sky lifting off again, she will come to sit on the porch like a dark sparrow and let the sun creep slowly onto her hair and grow old and wonder about the balance of things. And he, beside her, sitting too, distracted in the sun for hours. But all the same, both of them, at last, so much warmer.